Well, good morning and welcome to worship here this morning at Living Word Lutheran Church. As many of you can probably see and notice here, especially if you have been worshiping with us here in the past, this is not my home. This is, well, this is my second home in up sorts, but we are at the site of Living Word Lutheran Church and we are excited to, to be here today. It's a little strange here though. I mean, it's everything is empty, but you know, we're worshiping here. We have our our, our background here. We have our, our altar. We got the cross. We got our eternal flame and everything. And not that it makes worship, you know, more valid or it makes it um, better for God or whatever the case is. We have been glorifying God. We have been worshiping in our various places in my home. Um, I have streamed the, the service from different locations in my house. And it doesn't make a difference. It's all about coming together in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, gathered together as one body, worshiping our Lord and Savior. Yeah, there's a lot of memories here. Um, granted, we've only been here uh, worshiping in this place for about 14 Sundays. This is number 13 out of the sanctuary, so we're almost to that break-even point there. But um, we are here to worship and decided to give it a try here. And so... Welcome to worship here this morning, wherever you are watching, wherever you are gathering. It is great to be together again. A couple quick announcements here as we get going here this morning. First of all, the flowers that you see up there on the altar are given by uh, my wife and I, um, Connie, in honor of all the COVID-19 frontline workers. My wife is a nurse, and so this is very um, close to her heart, and also these are in memory of all of those healthcare workers that have lost their lives in this fight. At current, it's around 600 that have lost their lives in this fight. This is a very real thing that we are facing here, and so we want to remember all those who are still there taking care of patients and working hard to find a vaccine, cure, or treatment, or whatever the case is, and we continue to pray for all those healthcare workers. And so <clears throat> with that, uh, also, uh, those of you on my email list, uh, we have been talking about a drive-in service. And our hopes are that we will still do this next week. It's not official, so I don't want to get your hopes up quite yet. I want to make sure, we want to make sure, we did a test run yesterday and things are looking good. We have a different transmitter. We have another one coming that right now we're borrowing one, but we are going to, we have our own coming here. And Hopefully we got all of our T's crossed and I's dotted this time before we pull the trigger and go with it. Um, I will send an email out later this week with the official announcement of when that will take place. And it will happen here, 9.30 a.m. The live stream or the YouTube service will continue to happen at 9.30. So those of you watching and um, on YouTube, this will still happen. So just so that is clear. Um, both will continue. So that's what's coming up, some exciting things, and we'll keep you update on, updated on what's going on. So with that, uh, I invite you to prepare your hearts now as we enter a time of worship here this morning. Um, so let's, let's join together and let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise as we gather as your, your sheep, your, your children, um, your, your church, as we gather from wherever it is that we are located, we are scattered across this community, across the state, across this nation. In the, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we are gathered together. We are knit together. We are bound together through the faith that we share in Jesus Christ. And that's why we worship, it's why we gather, it's why we're here, to give you thanks and praise. For Jesus has died on the cross and rose from the grave that we may have new life. And that's the, the joy and excitement that we all share and why we're here to worship you, wherever it is. Whether it's here in the sanctuary or in my living room or out in the storage shed next to the building or wherever it is, we can praise and worship you. And so I ask for your blessing upon this time. May you be glorified in this time of worship. May you be praised 
and you hear our song, may you be pleased with that. Oh God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we enter this time of worship, we begin with the time of confession. And confession is more sin, and forgiveness is the center, the core of the gospel, as we know. It's why Jesus died on the cross for us. And so we want to enter this time here. I want to read for, to you from Psalm 119. It's, it's a long psalm, 176 verses, but it's comprised of the psalmist uh, longing for God's law, his testimonies, his precepts. And he, he wants to learn them better so he could not sin against God. He wants to glorify him, honor him, obey him. And so he asks through these verses to uh, be made more aware and to grow deeper into his law, not for salvation, but because you know, God is worthy. He is, you know, their suggestions, they're not suggestions, they, they are commands. And so I wanna, I'm going to read various sections out of Psalm 119 in these coming weeks here to guide us into our time of confession here. And so these are the first eight verses here. Psalmist writes, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart, when I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Verse 4 says, you've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. And so we confess here this morning that we have not. We are sinners. We have not kept his precepts diligently. So let's take a moment of silence here and offer up our confessions. Whatever they are, he hears us. He knows us. He knows them. Let us pray and offer up our confession. Oh, holy God, we are sinful. We have fallen short of your glory. We have not kept your precepts diligently. We've wandered in our own path. We've strayed from you. We've been disobedient. Oh, God, we ask that you may have mercy upon us and hear us each and every sin that we've committed. But most of all, we 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 acknowledge we are indeed sinful from the moment we take our first breath and through each and every day of our lives. We need your help. Have mercy upon us and hear us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Almighty God, his mercy has given his son to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. And so, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let us sing together. Those of you on my email list, you have received uh, the, the, the bulletin and the music. And we are going to sing from the green hymnal once again, number 551, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Indeed, we have much to be joyful about. Amen? Yes, amen. All right. Our next scripture reading here, we're going to stay in the Psalms, and we're going to be reading Psalm 100. I'll be reading once again, as I always do, out of the ESV translation. So we're at Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his people. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Holy and awesome God, yes, it is a joy to make a joyful noise to you. You are worthy, and we come to worship you, O God. You are indeed great. It's great to be gathered together to worship you for all that you are and all that you have done and all that you have promised. Continue to speak to us, O God, in your holy word. Bless these words that I proclaim. May they be um, God-glorifying and build us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Next, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 5. I'll be reading verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that, while we were still, still sinners, Christ died for us. Word of the Lord. And then, our text for preaching here this morning comes to us from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're in Matthew chapter 9, I'll be beginning at verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to God. <clears throat> what grace, peace, and love to you from God our Father and from the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we've all heard the phrase, there's no time like the present. Or maybe something else similar comes to mind. Do not put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Procrastination is a bug that has bitten most everyone. Just ask my wife. She can tell you many stories of that bug biting me. Well, I can do that tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it later on. You know what I'm talking about. When it comes to the kingdom, though, it's not a matter of God procrastinating like some may think. Well, it's been 2,000 years. Is God procrastinating? Some think so. But rather, this is about God's perfect timing. 
After all, time is in God's hands, right? He's sovereign. Time is in his hands. And so when God raises the urgency flag, we would do well to slap and kill the procrastination bug and get to work. My friends, the flag has been raised. Let's pray. Holy God, as I engage this text here this morning, as I proclaim these words, may I speak your words, may I seek to glorify you, point to you, not to myself, but to you. May your spirit move through these words and through the technology out to wherever we are hearing and into our hearts and souls transforming, bringing to life, lighting a fire underneath, and sending out, O oh God. The harvest is ready. The laborers are few. Send us, O oh God. Send us. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Well, let's get right into it here. We are in the last few verses of uh, Matthew chapter 9. And um, just please excuse me if I'm keeping looking over here. I'm just making sure everything is working correctly with our new setup here. So, um, so far, so good. So, in any case, we are in Matthew chapter 9 and the last four verses here. And so, it says here in verse 35, kind of sets the scene a little bit. Jesus is going through all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Now, you got to notice here what Je what's going on here. The ministry of Jesus, he was preaching the gospel and teaching. The very thing he commanded us to do in the Great Commission, which we looked at a couple weeks ago. But notice the message, what he's doing, what he's not doing. First of all, he's not preaching politics. He's preaching to a people who are under a very oppressive Roman government. So he's not preaching policy here and defying the government. He is preaching the gospel. So you never hear this strong political language coming through Jesus' teaching and preaching here. Secondly, he's not preaching a prosperity message, you know, like, send me a denarius and I will bless you. No. Wherever Jesus goes, he has compassion. Let the little children come to me. Um, healing diseases, casting out demons. Wherever he goes, he is doing this very thing. He's not looking for money. He doesn't have a place. He doesn't set up camp somewhere. He is going to various cities and villages. I must go there. And Jesus makes that clear to the disciples early on in his ministry. Thirdly, he doesn't rile the people up to take up arms against the Romans. Many thought he should be doing that, that he would be a military messiah to raise an army to, to fight against Romans, but he never does that kind of stuff. He doesn't rile people up. He doesn't gather people in protest and all this kind of stuff. He quietly goes about his business, preaching the gospel, teaching people, healing, loving on people, and doing that throughout the communities around the nation. And lastly, he doesn't preach a fair and equal society type of a message. Christians are going to suffer and this kind of thing. You know, he, so he's not out there, like I said, with some political politics, um, taking up arms, protesting, things like that. It's, everything is God glorifying. Everything is pointing to the message of salvation, grace, forgiveness. You just look at the te the, his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 through 7. I mean, Jesus is always glorifying God, always pointing to him. He's always showing compassion. Notice also in this text, in this verse here, it says, he healed every disease and every affliction. Every disease, every affliction. Not just some, not just many, not just most of them, but every one. He went about and he... He had because he has compassion. It, it shows us a couple things about Jesus. First of all, his deity. He's God. He can do this. He has a power. Nobody before or after Jesus healed like him. Yes, Paul, you know, Peter, John, they, they healed. 
but never on the level of Jesus. Jesus had power over them. When Jesus is in the Mount of Transfiguration, and they, and they, Peter, Jesus, Peter, James, and John come down the hill, and the, the disciples are arguing with some people here, and, and they were trying to heal this man's boy, and they couldn't do it. And so Jesus gets after him a little bit, but you know, they, they don't have the power to, over everything. They got a power over, he has power over demons. It also shows he has comp great compassion. His compassion is unsurpassed. He has great power. And so the verse 35 is more than just a editorial comment about the scene here. It's a statement about who Jesus is. And after hearing everything about Jesus, it makes the Pharisees' rejection of him all the more ridiculous and heinous. Anybody who would reject Jesus, I mean, I'm not, I'm not calling names out, I'm not pointing fingers or anything like that, but Jesus, is, it's clear. This is, this is God, but also his compassion is amazing. And we're going to see this a little bit more here as we get into this text, okay? So, so verse 36, it says, when he saw the crowds, okay, because he, he seemed to attract crowds. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, as we talked about. Because, now, this is the key part here. Because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. So he has compassion. And throughout the Gospels, you, you hear that word, compassion. Um, later on in the letters, you hear this admonition to Christians to show compassion. And so as Christians and as a church... That should be in our DNA. I mean, if we're Jesus followers, if we're disciples of Jesus, we live like our master, and our master showed compassion. So it makes sense. That's what we should be doing. But he has compassion. Notice why. <clears throat> because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were harassed and helpless. Jesus sees lost people because sheep without a shepherd will be harassed, and they are helpless. We've talked about this before. You, you put sheep out into a wilderness, they will be harassed by wolves, predators, and the like, by the elements. They will be helpless. They don't have natural defense systems. The only defense they possibly have is a huddle together in one big flock, but then the, out, the outside ones will get picked off, and the ones in the middle will live a little bit longer, but eventually they're going to be harassed. Basically, sheep, they need a shepherd. If they're going to survive, they're going to need a shepherd. It's why in, the, in Scripture, in, the, in the, the parable of the 99 sheep and the one lost one, when the shepherd notices the lost one, he doesn't go, oh, well, I'm missing a lost sheep. All right, well, I'll go get him after supper. No, he leaves the 99 with the hired workers, and he goes looking for them because he knows it's going to be harassed and helpless. There was a sense of urgency here. He sees lost sheep. You don't wait. Ezekiel 34 talks about the, the shepherds of the time, the, the, the religious leaders, how they have dropped the ball. And this is a very powerful text of God condemning those leaders. Let's, let's listen here. Ezekiel 34, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have you been, ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding them yourselves? Should not shepherds feed the sheep? Yeah. Yet you eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. You, the weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed. The injured you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they are scattered. Because there was no shepherd. And they became food for the wild beasts. This is the very thing that Jesus sees. Sheep without a shepherd. Harassed and helpless. Boom. This is what's going on here. And this is what Jesus is seeing. But he has come to be the shepherd. Micah 5, verses 4 and 5 says, And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, 
For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. So Jesus sees the harassed and helpless sheep. But he doesn't say, well, you know, I got some other things to do. I'll come back next week and I'll take care of you. No. There's urgency here. When you see harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd, that should send up a red flag. Something has to be done. There are many who are lost today. You were lost at one time. And at just the right time, the word of hope came to you, whenever that was. At one time, you were lost. But the word of hope came to you at just the right moment. Not because God was procrastinating, but the timing was right. And he didn't wait a second. The word of hope, the word of Jesus came to you. His death and resurrection, you were convicted of your sin. Because you are a sinner. But you heard that message that Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, that you may have life. And you were brought into the body, brought into the flock. A sense of urgency. And just watch the news. There, there are flocks of people, crowds of people out there, sheep without a shepherd. And they're lost. Have you noticed before? I, I believe many in the church have not. Thus this admonition from Jesus, this sense of urgency. Many think, many people think they're following a shepherd. But there's a huge difference. As you, as you watch the news and as you see those crowds of people, they'll say they have a leader, they have a cause, they have a purpose. But the big difference is this. Only one shepherd has died for his sheep. Only one shepherd has died for you. It's Jesus. No other shepherd will do that or can do that. Only one shepherd and even though people may think they're following a shepherd, if it's not Jesus, it's the wrong one. But yet they follow causes, they follow ideals, they follow dreams, they follow social justice, or whatever the case is. And this gives people a sense of purpose. They, 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 they feel like they have a family because other people are following the same thing. And, 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 that, and that's good for a moment, but it's only a temporary piece because that which they are following does not justify them in the eyes of God. Yes, God hates racism. God hates injustice. But you're not justified in the eyes of God just because you hate the thing that God hates. How are we justified in the eyes of God? Well, Paul lays that out pretty clearly for us. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through what? our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The peace with God comes through Jesus Christ, not through hating racism, not through anything else. It comes through Jesus. It comes through Jesus. But there's hope. The harvest is ready. Jesus says, the harvest is ready. Verse 37. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the labor, but the laborers are few. So the harvest here are the people ready to hear and receive the good news. That's the harvest. The har but you've got to remember, the harvest is something you bring in. It denotes readiness. Without people, the harvest cannot be brought in. The harvest will not harvest itself. I, it makes no difference how big or pretty a barn a farmer builds. The corn is not going to go, well, that's a pretty barn. Let's, let's go over there. Ridiculous, isn't it? <clears throat> the harvest, you, you have to get it. You must go get it. Okay? That's the whole point of a harvest. 
You have to go get it. You have to do the hard work. Jesus says the laborers are few. There is a sense of urgency. The harvest is ready. When it's ready, it's ready. No farmer looks at his field and says, oh, that corn looks good. It's ready to come in. Well, well, maybe next week I'll get time. I'm going to go on vacation. No. When the farmer sees it, he, he gets his laborers. He gets his machinery. They go into the field. Actually, they have everything ready to go before the harvest is ready. So when the harvest is ready, they're in the field. The urgency, the church can learn a lot from farmers. Can learn a lot from them. Serving back in Minnesota, I knew that during harvest season, if I wanted to talk to any of my church members who are farmers, well, I better wait. Because they're going to be in the field as much as possible because of the urgency of getting that in. You never know what's going to happen. A storm could come. Snow could come early in Minnesota. That could happen in September, October. Seen it. And it could delay harvest. So when it's ready, it's ready and you get it. The church needs that urgency. God had that urgency for you. When you were ready for the harvest, Jesus came into your life. Jesus says the harvest is ready. So he says what? Verse 38. Listen to this. Therefore, here's your therefore statement. All of this stuff, okay, there's lost people. You got to harass and help the sheep. They're ready for the gospel. Laborers are few. Therefore, he says, Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Pray earnestly. Prayer is important kingdom work in this urgent time. But not everyone sees it that way. Some people see it as laziness. I especially see this if there's a school shooting. And I see Christians on social media talk about we need to pray. And then Christians getting attacked saying prayer is not enough. We need action. See this all the time. But the thing is, prayer is important kingdom work. You can't save everybody. You can't go into every harvest, every field. But we pray that the Lord of the harvest sends the laborers into that harvest. And we also got to remember who the harvest belongs to. Who do we pray to? It's the Lord of the harvest, the God who owns that harvest. And we see the need send laborers into that harvest. Maybe you're not going into that particular harvest, but there's one around you of lost people that God will send you. But we also got to remember the harvest doesn't belong to you. It's God, so you can't take credit for the harvest. Oh yeah, we saved 50 people last year. Well, that's it. God saves more. But the point is, you didn't save. God does. But also, if this is God's harvest, and it is, and Jesus is expressing urgency, who are we to wait? If the Lord of the harvest says it's time, it behooves us to listen. And what do we pray for? It says to send out laborers. I love this word because it's not just like, okay, the harvest is ready, people. Now, I want you to go. Yeah, you're over here. Yeah, you just go. It's like he's pointing. I'm going to send you over there. No. The word here has the sense of thrust out, to expel, to drive out. There's a, there's a forcefulness to this word. He's not pointing his finger. If you get some time, can you just please go over there? No. It's almost like he's taking his hands and saying, there you go, into the harvest. Now, off you go. Remember when Jesus was baptized, and after he was baptized and all that, it says he went into the wilderness, and he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights, fasting and, and the like. It says, does it say, yeah, he just strolled out into the wilderness when he was, you know, dried off and ready to go? No, it says he was driven by the Spirit. He was driven by the Spirit. 
And this is the sense here. It is so urgent that the sending is who? Living word has been sent. We were in a big building on South Hill. Habitat, a lot of, lot of room, but it wasn't ours. For 10 years, we worshiped in that building. And we looked and we looked and we looked for our, our, a building of our own. But when the timing was right, this building came about and God sent us here. And, and, and to me, when I look back, it seems to happen pretty quickly. We get in here, we get it set up, and now we're here. God has sent this church into this harvest here in ground. He thrust us out of South, South Hill into Graham. In a lot of ways, we've been thrust out of this building now and into our homes, into our communities, wherever that may be. You thought of it that way before? There's a harvest where you are at and you've been thrust out. Think about that. God is using this time for his harvest. God has sent you into that harvest because it's ready. It's ready. We need to pay attention to the fields out there. Not to the fields over in Seattle, the fields over in Atlanta, or the fields over someplace else in the country, but there are fields that we're in the midst of. And the Lord of the harvest needs laborers. He needs you and me. As I said, we have already been sent here, and now we've been sent out. Now what? We need to notice the sheep that don't have a shepherd. That don't have a shepherd. They will die without the shepherd. They will die without Jesus. That should give some urgency. My friends, through faith in Jesus, you have been forgiven. Through faith in Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and that means you have peace with God. You're justified in the eyes of God. You have peace, and peace is in short supply these days. People are looking for a shepherd to save them. The very shepherd who laid down his life for you. People are looking for purpose, the very life you've been given through Jesus Christ. People are looking for peace, the very Holy Spirit that fills your heart through Jesus Christ. Being justified <clears throat> through faith in Jesus, let us do the work of the kingdom that God may be glorified. The harvest is ready, is plentiful. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers. Pray that he sends you. Pray that he opens your eyes to see the helpless and harassed sheep around you. But don't fear. Remember the Great Commission. And lo, I am with you, even to the very end of the age. He is with you. My friends, the harvest is ready. It is ready. Let us go and praise God always and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. Let's sing together. We're going to sing our next song. It is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
Yes, let's stand up for Jesus and head into the harvest. All right, let's take some time, take a moment here and join together as a people of God and let's confess our faith and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, at this time, we would normally have our offering here, and I just want to thank everyone for the offerings that you continue to send in and the offerings that are being done online. The online giving seems to be going up here, more people using that, and it does work, and those of you that um, have been doing that know that it's been received, and um, so thank you for all those offerings, your tithes, your gifts that you have given to this ministry as we uh, work in this harvest field that God has sent us into. And so all of that is very important. So if you feel moved to do that, to give a gift, you can go to our website, www.livingwordlutheranchurch.com, and there will be a giving page. You can go to that, and it will um, tell you about the different ways to do that. And I will have the address and all of that and the description, the about section of this worship video here. So, um, so with that... Um, let's move into a time of prayer. A couple of prayer requests that have uh, come through here this week here. Uh, some of you already know this here, but I'll just read this message here. This is from our brothers and sisters in Christ. From It's an LCMC church in Battle Lake, Minnesota. They write, asking for prayers as we lost our beloved 100-plus-year-old church building Saturday evening to a fire. Our church family is strong, but extremely heartbroken. Bethel Lutheran Church, LCMC, rural Battle Lake, Minnesota. Last I heard, it was a lightning strike. I haven't gotten an official confirmation of that, but that was the initial um, thinking there. And so prayers for our brothers and sisters in Battle Lake, Minnesota. Uh, they are worshiping, but they're just not in that beautiful building. They're, they're someplace else, but they are worshiping. They are a church. Nobody was hurt. Nobody was killed. We give, you, we give God thanks for that. And so prayers for them as they move forward in ministry and rebuild. Also, uh, prayers for Gary Ritchie. Uh, I sent an email out here and just to get everybody up to speed here in case you haven't seen that. June 9th, uh, Tuesday, June 9th, this was the email uh, from Carol. Uh, Gary has had a setback. Yesterday he had an aortic um, dissection, dissection late in the day. He was transported to University of Washington from Good Sam by ambulance. He had surgery at 1 a.m. Thank the Lord for our oldest son who made the contacts and the great UW staff and surgical team. He did well. He is in ICU for several days and then a week more in transition before release. And then yesterday, on June 13th, I got a follow-up email from Carol. Gary is doing really well. They have removed all IVs and chest tubes. He is walking on his own. He is ready to go home, doctor says, Monday. Lots of restrictions and upper body and arm movement, but he's doing awesome. Thank you for all your prayers. God is good. And so continued prayers for Gary Ritchie and for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Battle Lake. Um, with that, let's... Join together in prayer. Holy and awesome God, we give you thanks. As we gather together here as your, your children, as your, your sheep, we are thankful that under our shepherd, Jesus Christ, we are not harassed, we are not helpless. We are far from that. We are safe and secure and at peace with you. And thus we worship and praise you, O God. There is so much weighing in our hearts right now, oh God, so much going on in the world. And 
We need your help. We need your peace. This world, this nation needs your peace, O oh God. Send us into the, the field, for the harvest is indeed ready. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for healing for those in need of healing, O oh God. For those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit, those who are recovering from various ailments or injuries, um, we especially lift up those who are dealing with this COVID-19 virus. We ask for healing for them and protection for all those who are fighting this on the front lines, our doctors and nurses and other caregivers. We also lift up to you Gary Ritchie as he recovers from his surgery and his little setback. May you continue to bring healing to him, protect him and Carol, uh, put a hedge of protection around them, grant them peace, O oh God. Um, we give you thanks that you have um, kept their faith strong through this, through these various trials, O oh God. And we ask for their a blessing on them. And we also lift up to you in all those in our bulletin, in our, in our prayer list that we've been praying for week in and week out. And anyone else we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ at Bethel Lutheran Church in Battle Lake, Minnesota, as they mourn the loss of their beautiful church building. But we give you thanks, O oh God, that their mindset is the fact that it's just a building and that the church itself, the people, are fine. Wrap them in your loving arms, O oh God, as they go through this time of mourning. And as you lead them into the future ahead, O oh God, and what it looks like for them, for rebuilding or whatever the case may be, O oh God. We know that you are glorified no matter where we worship, whether it's in a, a church building, in homes, or in a rented space. We, you are glorified because it's your people gathered together to sing your praises, O oh God. And so bless them. Bless their pastor as he, as he or she leads that congregation. And all the people, um, bring them together, keep them strong as a testimony to the community around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we just pray for all, this, all the racial tensions going on in our nation. We especially, recently we think of Atlanta and the, the shooting that happened there and now the protests and the violence that are going on in Atlanta and other places um, that continue to see some tensions going on over the, the George, George Floyd killing in Minneapolis. And Lord God, there is just so much. And it's just, you look at the news, it's almost overwhelming. You want to do something, but you just don't know what. And so, so may at the, at the very least, may we just continue to pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, to send workers into those, vine, those vineyards, to those, those fields that's ready for the harvest. And whether it's us or not, oh God, um, we just ask that you may send those laborers to preach this word of hope. This world needs this. We're not going to solve racial tensions through legislation. It's only through you. So help us, oh God. May your peace abound. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Once again, oh God, for all the frontline workers of this pandemic, our healthcare workers. We especially remember those who have died. Remember their families and loved ones who are mourning their deaths as they, they have given their lives basically for the lives of others <clears throat> as they have been fighting this virus and caring for those who are sick. So pray, place a hedge of protection around these workers, oh God, and all those who are out there. This is a very real thing. And but you are a sovereign, you are bigger than this virus. We know, you know, we know that you could snap your fingers and eradicate this in a moment. And we continue to boldly ask for that. But we just ask that you may um, just, in the midst of this, oh God, use us for your glory, or however that may look. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. As the church makes difficult decisions during this time, and what worship looks like, and how to do ministry and care for one another. Pray for all the pastors out there who are making difficult decisions. People telling them to do this, do that. Pressures from all sides, oh God. Keep them strong, oh God. 
it, it's, it's a difficult time. None of us were trained for something like this. We have to rely solely on you, O oh God, not on anything we've learned from books or seminars or classes or anything, but solely on you, O oh God. To bless your church, the pastors, the councils, the, the, the church leadership, that we may be faithful to what you are doing and where you are leading. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks for hearing us, being here this morning, and guiding us through our lives. We thank you that we are a church solely because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us, to die and rise, that we may have new life, and through the Holy Spirit, we are knit together as a church, as a one body, as one flock, not a harassed and helpless, but secure in your arms. Peace with you. We praise you for that. Lead us out into this mission field once again here this morning and each and every day. May we bring glory to your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this time we are going to gather for a time of Holy Communion. So if you have uh, your wine or grape juice and your bread, ready to go. I encourage you to do that right now. We're going to have a time of communion together. And if you don't have that or you don't feel comfortable doing it that way or this way here virtually, then that, that's fine. <clears throat> There's no shame in not doing it, okay? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But we just know I mean, we are knit together. And yeah, we're not gathered in this room. You know, I'm not standing up here doing the the thing I'm, I'm used to doing here with people watching and participating, but we are still knit together through the Holy Spirit, and we are still one body, wherever we are at. And so do it in with that confidence, um, whether you're having communion or not, but at the very least, hear the words of promise that are through these, that come through these words here, God. It's God's voice, it's God's promises, and that's what we are partaking together. And so, with that, <clears throat> we remember in a night in which was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it and gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Joined together by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, which has been given for you. And now this is the blood of Christ, which has been shed for you.
Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for this gift of life, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask that you may strengthen us in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it has been great to worship with you here this morning in the sanctuary here at Living Word. Um, I pray for God's blessings upon your day. Um, may God be glorified in your life as you go out into the, the harvest for his glory, O oh God. And we just give you thanks, O oh God, for this. And so blessings on your day. And we will be in touch later this week about what's going to happen uh, with the drive-in service, when that's going to happen, and more details about that. So just watch your email. And so with that, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.